Thank you very much for the intro. Um, so as we've said, my name is Nick, and I am the engineering manager for the ecosystem API team at GitHub. Uh, so that is the team that runs both our GraphQL and REST API. Yes, we have both. Um, I've worked at GitHub for about a year, so the GraphQL journey actually started before I even uh, came on. But I've been shepherding it and moving it forward. Um, and when we talk about GraphQL, we use the word platform a lot. And I want to go into that first to kind of talk about what we mean when we say platform. Um, and it's more than just code hosting. It's more than just code. When we say platform, we mean creating connections between users and developers and companies building CI software, rich integrations on GitHub. I think um, earlier we were just talking about Apollo being uh, built into GitHub and uh, automatically linting and showing that right in the GitHub UI. That's a platform to us. That's the ability for GitHub to bring uh, people inside of GitHub closer to the information that they need and closer to the tools that they want to use. Um, and kind of what does that have to do with GraphQL? Uh, we brought out GraphQL out of a desire to get closer to our API consumers and to create deeper hooks for them into the GitHub UI. Being platform first and being platform native or whatever the term you want to use is more than just providing a REST API and letting people pull data out of GitHub and create comments. It's designing our features to be platform first. It's uh, write, writing our code so that we have equal access to the same thing that our third party developers do. And we create things with the intention of uh, you know, democratizing it and making it so that anyone can get their information on it, anyone can get their information off it, and anyone can use kind of the GitHub platform. And why GraphQL? Uh, because GraphQL driven development for us means a better platform. Uh, when we build a new feature, we're not saying, OK, what does the UI look like? Let's design it. What data do we need here and there? We're creating our domain in GraphQL, and we're building GraphQL first. And we use that to create the UI. We use that to create the API. We use that to create the REST API. And we use GraphQL as a utility for designing features for all of our API consumers. Uh, in essence, when I think about it, um, I think that GraphQL helps us treat every customer as being equal on our platform. By standardizing on that layer right there of GraphQL, that domain becomes the API that everybody uses by default. Underneath that, we can change the implementation of something out. We can add caching. We can change data structures. We can do it all transparently because GraphQL provides that domain on top. Um, and to us, this is incredibly important for platform-first development because, like I said, it, it means everyone is equal. Everyone hits that same schema. Uh, every integrator, every customer, everyone who builds GitHub.com gets to use the exact same domain, but uh, you know, underneath we can kind of do whatever we want. We can swap things out. So going into this a little bit more, um, I kind of want to talk a little bit about our GraphQL timeline. As was mentioned, we were early adopters, uh, I would say. So early 2016, we shopped around and we said, we've got this REST API. It, at that point, was about six years old, uh, kind of bits and pieces bolted on. Every new feature came out with the REST API, sometimes right after we built the feature, sometimes six months after we built the feature. We, we weren't necessarily paying a lot of attention um, all the time. So we set out and we said, OK, what can we build? What can we do to make sure that uh, we are building a platform, that we are doing the best thing for our users and the best thing for the people uh, integrating um, against GitHub? And so my mic fell off. Um, and so we, we looked. You know, we looked at OData. We looked at Falcor. We looked at GraphQL. And we loved the simplicity of the spec. We loved that it was neutral, but that we could use it to model our domain. And we built a very small, simple proof of concept that has never seen the light of day. Uh, we loved it so much that we kept working on it. And in September of 2016, just a few months later, we released an early access public GraphQL API. Uh, about, I think that's six months later, we said, OK, this is working. We're adding schema. Uh, everything is going well. Let's bring it generally available, and let's bring this public GraphQL API to the world. But the public API isn't the only place that we use GraphQL. The public API is actually just a small sliver, uh, which brings me to my next topic, which is where does GitHub actually use GraphQL? Is it just the public API? 
Uh, the answer is no. Um, the answer is that it is in so many places you wouldn't believe it. Uh, one, of the, one of them is our RESTv3 API. So as we've been building features with GraphQL, as we've been going GraphQL first, we said, hey, if we want to build a REST API for this because we haven't deprecated the REST API and REST is still very important to us, what if we just wired up our routes, built mutations or built queries, mash the data up a little bit, and just return it in REST. And no one would ever know that it's backed by GraphQL. And it lets us iterate much faster on doing this. Um, and, and instead of having to maintain a parallel set of code, instead of having to maintain active record models and GraphQL and all of this kind of stuff, it all just goes through that GraphQL layer, just like we wanted. Um, and this, you know, this we think is part of the long-term vision. We, we might not get rid of our REST API. We haven't really made that determination. But when we think about how we want to maintain it, it's just using GraphQL underneath and making it very easy for engineers at GitHub to be able to say, OK, yeah, we want a REST API for this feature. We'll just build it in GraphQL. It's going to take a couple days, and there it is. Um, <laughs> we'll see. Uh, I'm not quite there yet. Um, and GraphQL also powers GitHub.com. So if you load a GitHub.com web page, chances are you are running at least one GraphQL query to fulfill that. And what I think is interesting about this is that we're not using uh, any, any JavaScript to do this. We're not querying over the web. This is actually all done inside of Ruby on Rails. So we render our HTML with ERB. We run, uh, we, we run a, a GraphQL query against the executor. It just hits the GraphQL code in the same code base produces the result, our fragments are co-located with our views, and you get HTML out, um, all still based on that exact same GraphQL code, which is, I, I think, a little bit different than um, how other people are, are using and are querying their information with GraphQL. Um, and then the, the last piece, uh, this is going to sound funny, um, but GraphQL also powers GraphQL. So as other people have said, wow, this is so cool. GraphQL lets us model our domain so well. GraphQL is so sweet. We want to go build a, a service, a microservice, a macroservice, whatever you want to call it. But we don't want to give up this GraphQL. Uh, so what did they do? They just built a GraphQL service. Um, they went out, you know, they, they, they modeled their domain. They, they built what they wanted to do. Uh, in order to get it onto that public API to kind of build that platform, uh, they just query the GraphQL API inside of the GraphQL resolver. Uh, it's not exactly exactly what I would say super smooth right now, uh, but it, we see it as a, a picture of the future, right? If we talk about GraphQL first, if we talk about really wanting people to use GraphQL, why not build other services in it and why not model everything and then just kind of figure out how to get it all back together in the, the public API? Um, what does this add up to? Uh, this adds up to executing about half a billion GraphQL queries on the average day. Um, depends on, you know, sometimes on weekends it's a little bit lower and stuff like that. But uh, across the REST API, across our public GraphQL API, and across GitHub.com, we do a fair amount of, uh, of queries. Uh, I, I think so anyway. Um, you be the judge. And more importantly, I think, is with the GraphQL first and with the amount of work that we're putting into this, um, we have over 190 contributors to our GraphQL schemas internally. So we're not the API team that builds the GraphQL API. We're not the, okay, you take a feature, you go ahead, we'll build the API for it. Um, when we have people developing GraphQL first, they ship to the same schema that we do. They ship to the same public API we do. Um, and they are able to launch it just the same that we would. Um, and this, this wasn't easy. It wasn't easy to get the tools, it wasn't easy to get the processes, it wasn't easy to get the buy-in to have almost 200 people be contributing on a regular basis to the same GraphQL endpoint. Um, in fact, when we first started this, I would say a lot of GitHub was very, very, very skittish about GitHub. They weren't sure, you know, is this something that we should go all in on? Is, is this something that we want to be using every day? Um, and it, it caused a lot of friction. Going GraphQL first was not something that was easy. These are actual issues that have been opened up uh, in, in places. Um, they were worried that it was going to make their code more complex. They were worried that, um, you know, the, the tools weren't developed enough and that they were just butting up against something that they didn't understand, that they couldn't debug, and that was opaque to them. Um, so we had to go out and we had to say, OK, let's prove the value. Let's demonstrate that if we do this right, if we go for this GraphQL API, we can do all sorts of things. So you, people can be more empowered to use the API. Features can be built faster if we learn GraphQL. Um, but that, that wasn't easy. Um, that was very, very much not. Um, and it further was compounded by the fact that taking an existing code base, GitHub's been around for 10 years, um, and then GraphQLizing it, right? If you want to build a feature, chances are you're touching other features in the code base. 
that probably means you might have to add some GraphQL schema for a feature that's existed for four years to make sure that you can access that part of the database to make sure that you're going um, kind of GraphQL first, GraphQL native. Um, so GraphQL acted like a forcing function in that case. We said, OK, if you want to build something, if you want to go GraphQL first, you now have to model this feature that's been around for six years inside of GraphQL. Um, and that, that, uh, that feature has uh, kind of evolved organically over time. That feature was not thought up in a nutshell. Uh, organic is a nice word. Um, how do you shove that into then GraphQL schema with strict typing, with null ability? I can, can't tell you the number of times we've thought, oh, that will never be null. No, no way. Uh, three days later, someone goes, I can't get this page to load. And we go, oh, it was null, wasn't it? Uh, we, we didn't think about that. Um, and so then the, you know, that, that has further challenges. You have to change the schema. You have to figure out how to handle nulls in your code and teach other people how to handle null ability. Um, it, it, I think of it like kind of like shining a flashlight under your bed. Uh, you never really want to do it because you haven't cleaned under there in a while. And you peek under and you kind of go, ooh, oh man. Um, and that was, what, that was what GraphQLizing things was for us. It was taking a hard look at what we'd built and then figuring out how to fit it into the rigid kind of GraphQL type system. Uh, but it also allowed us to revisit a lot of these things. Is this how this data model should work? Is this how this should relate to each other? So taking the good with the bad, what we really had to do is make sure we empowered people to want to do that. Uh, because if they wanted to, then there was no problem. If they didn't, there was no way they were going to. Uh, and then once you've built your GraphQL schema, keep in mind now, when I said we've got it through our REST API, through our, our github.com, and through our GraphQL API, we're basically building the same schema for multiple consumers. We've got the internal schema that has sensitive information that we would never want to release and, and stuff like that. And then we've also got uh, the public API that we need to you know, give this information for. Um, they need to figure out, OK, how are we going to use this schema? How are they going to use this schema? What does the permission story look like? And all of this. Um, so we actually have multiple schemas. We have an internal and an external schema. They share their resolver code, and they share a lot. And the internal schema is kind of a superset. Um, but we always have to be thinking now, if you're prototyping a feature, maybe you write it in the internal schema. But then you can build GitHub.com and the REST API with just that internal schema. So we have to make sure we have tools to help people want to release their schema to the public to make sure that everybody can use it and, and to make sure that it works. Um, we also have GitHub Enterprise, which has its own complications around versioning and things like that. So it wasn't easy to figure out how we could make one GraphQL API work across everywhere, and we weren't going to build more than one. Uh, so I've got a, a visualization here. This is a, a current rendering uh, from GraphQL Voyager, for those of you who've used it, of our public schema only. Uh, no previews uh, as of yesterday. Uh, I tried to get our internal schema modeled up here, but I actually couldn't get any tool to render it. Uh, I got about 70, 80 megabytes into a PNG. <laughs> And then decided to give up because uh, it was never going to show up and never going to be useful. So this is, this is today. This is the, the, the GitHub GraphQL public API. And obviously, it's too small to see anything. Even I can up here. But this just shows how complicated our data model is and how long it took to fit everything together to find out how everything is related. Um, and it, it can get very confusing very quickly. We, half of the questions we field are, how do we build this with GraphQL? The other half are, how do we get this information out of GraphQL to build our view or to build the tools that we want? Um, and this brings me to one of my biggest points about the, the troubles we hit and what we decided to do to fix them, and that is establish best practices early. When you've got 200 developers all building on the same GraphQL API, all working together and all trying to produce something that looks cohesive, make it as hard as possible to do the wrong thing. We have linters that check for breaking changes to make sure people can't ship them to the public. Uh, linters that check for improper use of Booleans, for people using null abilities to warn them that you know, they might not want to do that. Uh, this could whole, be a whole talk in and of itself, all of the little tiny schema nits uh, that other people have talked today that we just automatically check against now because it happened once, and we wanted to make sure that it could never happen again, but without us having to stay vigilant and without us having to watch. Um, and the other thing is that you have to invest in tools. Um, if you're going to do this right, if you're going to have a public API, if you're going to run this many queries through, you have to know what's going on. And you have to tell other people what's going on. Because um, we have public API consumers that depend on it's not breaking. We can't just you know, ship a change, ship a nullability fix. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those tools that we've built, the, the reasoning, and, and how they're helpful. Um, 
The first one is uh, breaking changes. And that's kind of a dirty word. Uh, we were really gung-ho. We were like, no, we never have to do a breaking change. We'll just add things. Uh, things, things never, never break. Uh, but that kind of ended quickly. Um, things do break. We add features that change the way our data model works. We realize that something shouldn't have been shipped, an error, or something like that. And if you look at our REST API, if you really take a deep dive, you'll see that there are inconsistencies all over it because we didn't want to break the REST API either. We're talking like timestamps in different formats. You get a Unix timestamp here and an ISO 8601 date stamp there. Like, it, it's not great. And we wanted to do better for GraphQL. So what we sat down was and we figured, what do people who are querying the GraphQL API need? And we said, well, they want to know when breaking changes are going to happen. It's got to be predictable. We've got to give them enough warning. So um, every quarter, things that have been deprecated for at least three months get pulled out of the schema, and we've got a change log that tracks it. We have tools, which I'll talk about later, to, to make sure that we're letting people know. And we, we try to give people as much warning as possible. Um, we also change, track positive changes. So thanks to the power of GraphQL, we're able to check the schema every night and say what's been added. Uh, make a blog post, make an RSS feed, so that people can just kind of stay abreast. If Google Reader was still around, you could subscribe to it, and you could say, hey, look at that. The URL field was added to, to label today. Oh, I've been looking for that, or, or something like that. Um, and then we also added preview periods. And this is something that's interesting. So when we talk about having multiple schemas, in reality, we have a big schema and a slightly different schema for every preview period. And this is because we wanted something that was before shipped to production. When we build a feature, especially because we're building our UI with it and we're building the entire domain with it, we're not always sure if it's right. And we want to be able to ship it as quickly as possible to people, but also be able to change it if we want to. So we kind of reserve the right with previews to keep them out for three to six months and to change them on a much shorter notice. A breaking change could be a few weeks instead of six months, uh, because we want to make sure that you know, we don't lose velocity as we, we ship these to the public, which would just cause us to ship fewer things out into the world. Um, and the last one, uh, this is my favorite, are fine-grained metrics on field usage. So once we've reached out, once we've done all of these things, we've got deprecation periods, we've got notices, we send emails, we have blog posts and stuff like that. There are some times when people are still using these deprecated fields a week out before we remove them. Uh, so we actually shuttle every single query, every single type, object, and field that is, you, I don't have real numbers in here, but you can imagine what the numbers are. Um, every single query gets put into a data warehouse, and we're able to say on a very granular basis how many people have queried this object and this type. Who are they? We can pull their emails out. We can pull out whatever we need. And we can reach out to them in a one-on-one -on -one way if we have to and say, just so you know, in three weeks, this query is not going to be valid anymore. Here's the alternative. Um, and this is really powerful for us because it means we can have a high touch uh, impact on, on our integrators without having to worry too much that we're just going to go break something. And this is something we didn't get with REST, where we knew people were querying endpoints, but how many people are depending on it being a Unix timestamp instead of an ISO date time? Nobody knows. Uh, but with GraphQL, we're finally able to get that. And uh, Kind of in closing, um, our journey isn't done. You know, we, we've done all of this. We've built all of these tools. We've gotten all of these linters. But our public GraphQL API isn't complete. Uh, we still have a lot more to write. We still have a lot more to make uh, available to the public. There, we want more mutations. We want better performance. And we just want more GraphQL everywhere. We want more people bought in. And we want more that works. We're always working to make people more productive in GraphQL inside of GitHub and outside of GitHub. And we're also looking at features like subscriptions or live queries and other things that make our GraphQL API even more powerful and can potentially replace platform primitives that we have, like webhooks, which are also very old and maybe could use a little bit of an upgrade. So that's me. Uh, thanks for listening to me talk. I could talk about this for hours. Chat with me afterward if you have any questions. <laughs>